All right. Happy Sunday. This is Ask a Priest Live with Father George Elliott. If you have not already, please go ahead and find your rosary. We'll get started on that in a second. Um, and uh, I'm going to sh share on the platforms that I'm supposed to do that on. And we will go from there. All right. Things are not working well, it looks like. Also, if you would share the video onto any uh, Catholic or non-Catholic um, groups that you're a part of, basically just getting it out to, to more people so that more people can connect and have their questions answered and hopefully grow in their faith, which is really what we're all about. All right, I got one more. And I am ready to go. And we'll get started on the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So go ahead and grab your rosaries, and we'll get started now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. 
Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, welcome to everybody who's connected in. This is Ask a Priest Live. Uh, we just finished with the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and we're going to get started on the reflection on the readings here in a minute. Um, if you haven't already, please, uh, first off, do any of the engagement things, like the share, subscribe, like button, smiley face, all those things. Um, but also go ahead and type in where you're from. It's fun to see just where everybody's connecting in from. I can see a few people have already. Sarah from Oklahoma, it's good to have you. And Joan from Nacogdoches, hello. Terry, uh, didn't write in, but from Houston, it's good to have you. Uh, and bon Bonji, Bongi, uh, hello. God bless you as well. All right, and Van, hello, hello. And also Joy from Virginia Beach. Great to have all of you guys. Thanks for connecting in. Um, also, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in now. There's a bit of a delay from when you type them in to when I can see them. And so if you just type those in, then uh, basically it populates and we can just move right through those questions. And I start at the top of the list and work my way down throughout the hour uh, and get to as many questions as I can. Sometimes we've got more questions than we have time to answer. And so if you type it in now, that'll really allow me to um, uh, basically get to your question uh, earlier on. Great. So looking at um, the readings for we're going to look at next week. Um, what I want to look at is specifically the gospel. So this is the gospel of John chapter 14, which is set within the uh, the Last Supper discourse, which is the fairly long multiple chapter discourse or talk that Jesus gives to the apostles during the Last Supper. It goes from chapter 13 to chapter 17 in the Gospel of John. So it's this really big chunk of, uh, of the Gospel of John. And Jesus really talks about a lot of very deep and, and rich things. And I, I'm going to point out about half, well, I'll go ahead and read the, the whole thing and then I'll comment on it. So this is John chapter 14, verses 23 to 29. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. 
So what I want to focus on is the line, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. So th this idea that um, the Holy Spirit is the advocate and when essentially we live in accord with the Holy Spirit, then also we have peace. Uh, so this idea that the advocate is the Holy Spirit, there, that the Holy Spirit is the advocate, is that uh, you know the Holy Spirit is the one that essentially speaks out on your behalf. That word advocate is almost kind of like the defense lawyer. It's the, the one who, who protects the accused in a court of law. Who, who is, in a certain sense, makes excuses for the person. Um, and so the, the Holy Spirit, in a certain sense, is the one that, that uh, you know, protects us from guilt. However, I think we, we easily misunderstand this. It's not a, a protection from guilt in the sense of the Holy Spirit just tells us that what we did in the past isn't wrong. Actually, the truth itself is what calls out our wrong. Right? Earlier this week, we had a gospel in which Jesus says, you know, I come to judge no one, but uh, the words that I have said, they will judge them. That essentially the, the truth uh, is the, the thing that clarifies whether our actions are right or wrong. You can even see a little bit this connection here. It says the Holy, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. In a sense, what Christ has already taught teaches us what is good and what is evil. And then our actions either correspond to that and they're good, or they don't correspond to that and they're evil. That's really where the, the goodness and evil comes from. Where the Holy Spirit is the advocate is that he, in a sense, he calls out, right? That's what advocate, he, he almost screams, shouts out and says, Conversion is possible. Repentance is possible. By the grace of God, human beings can change, and they deserve to be given a second chance if they are willing to work with the Holy Spirit. Our culture today really does it in a completely opposite way. So when it comes to sin, more often than not, people just reject the reality of sin. They say, no, that thing that you did wrong, no, it's not actually wrong. It's fine. You do you. Be free. All of these types of sayings, it's, a, it's an attempt to actually take away the word of Christ, take away the truth, so that there is no such thing as sin. However, ironically, essentially, the same people who say those types of things have also created an opposite extreme in cancel culture, in which if you do certain things wrong, there is no possibility of repentance. You have been canceled. You are done. You're a horrible person. You now have to go into exile. Uh, you're, you know, th there is no possibility of conversion. And this culture, the culture of, you know, be free, you do you, uh, you know, don't let other people tell you what you can do with its complete opposite that somehow exists in the same people of cancer, cancel culture is really, it's an anti-Holy Spirit culture. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, first off, tells us what is a sin and what is not, but also is our advocate and says, yes, this person may have sinned, but they have an opportunity for repentance. If they will work with me, they can convert. And so, Whenever we look at, uh, you know, people or the actions that people have done, we need to really conform our minds to have that, um, not the cancel culture or not the you do you culture, but really the culture, the life of the Holy Spirit in which we see, yes, there is right and wrong and co actions either correspond or do not correspond with that. And yet those people who are doing those actions, they have the opportunity for repentance if they will work with the Holy Spirit, the advocate. Good. And so hopefully that helps everybody to shift a little bit that mentality and, and really almost confront it head on. Uh, we see it so much in social media and in different places. Uh, but if we're really going to be Christians, we need to speak the truth into, into that void that repentance is possible and there is such a thing as good and evil. 
great. I can see a, a good number of people have connected in. It's, it's great to have all of you. Welcome. Uh, if you haven't already, please type in where you're from. It's fun to see where everybody's connecting in from. We've got a good, good crew today. Also, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type in your question and I'll, I'll get to it as soon as I can. There's a bit of a delay from when you hit enter to when I can actually see it. And so if you hit enter now, that allows it to essentially make its way through the internet and, and get to my feed. Uh, so that uh, there isn't a, a delay when I get to that last question and, and then there aren't any more and we have to kind of sit and wait for people to type more in. Um, it's best if you just type it in now and then I'll just work right through the list and I start from the first comment that was sent in and go down from there. Great, so I can see uh, Karina is connected. Good to have you, welcome. And Lilia from Lufkin, hello. Um, Van from California, great to have you. And Eileen from Scotland. Welcome. Good stuff. So I can see Ray has got a question here. Uh, he says, good afternoon, Father George. We are studying the Gospel of Matthew and are in chapter 26. We are trying to understand the sequence of events. We know that Jesus and the disciples had the room prepared for the Feast of the Passion. Chapter 26 mentions the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Passion, and the Last Supper. In what order did they occur? Um, let me pull up chapter 26. Uh, to understand exactly what you're talking about there. All right. <laughs> so there's the... Ah, the Feast of the Unblended, um, Unleavened Bread. I imagine it was it's the Feast of the Passover and the, the Last Supper. Um, so essentially, they all that that's all one thing. It's all the, the same concept. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread is the Feast of Passover. And essentially, the Feast of Passover was renewed or um, improved, expanded upon, um, perfected, really, you could say, by Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. Uh, so just to connect all of that and how they're all connected, the Passover meal obviously came from uh, Moses, the, the time of, of Moses and Egypt and the Israelites leaving Egypt and uh, crossing over the Red Sea. Right. So you can recall the, the, you know, the 10 plagues. The last plague was the death of the firstborn, which is very connected to that feast of the Passover. And it was called the Passover because the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites who had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Um, it then eventually became referred to as the feast of the unleavened bread because uh, the Israelites had to get all of the leaven out of their houses. They had to, they couldn't have any leaven in their houses for essentially a week. Uh, and so any of the bread that they ate was unleavened. And so it became referred to kind of colloquially as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then uh, Jesus, at the, at the time of Jesus, his last supper, the, the last supper that he ate with his, uh, with his apostles on Holy Thursday night, uh, that was actually the time of the Feast of the Passover. Uh, that's when they would have had that Passover meal with the lamb. Um, and then there were, there were bitter herbs and a few cups of wine and uh, some un unleavened bread all at that time. Um, he takes that meal and it's clear for the first three cups of the meal, it was broken up by cups, essentially, at different times that you would drink some wine. Um, and it, it seems clear that he followed the ritual up to that third cup. But then at the third cup, it just goes completely off and it's, it's a different rite. And so it's understood by theologians that that was Jesus taking the old Passover, that time in which uh, really the Israelites were saved from slavery to the Egyptians. And he, he uses the Passover meal to uh, essentially create the new ritual meal of Christianity by which Christians would be saved from slavery to the devil. Um, and so that's kind of how the three of those are connected there. Let me know, Ray, if I misunderstood your question and I'll, I'll take another swing at it. But I think I think that was the, the clarification that was being looked for. Great question. All right. Now, Joan has a question. Uh, she says, Father Elliot, what do you think about this? 
Ever since grade school, when I first saw the play Jesus Christ Superstar, I felt sorry for Judas. No one knows if he is damned for all time, but I feel he's uh, God's will and plan. Judas didn't ask Jesus for forgiveness, but didn't he return the silver and confess his wrongdoings to Caiaphas, then hung himself? Wasn't Judas more aware of the purpose that Jesus had on earth than any other apostle? I also read that donate his sperm eggs. Um, it got cut off. Shucks. Um, so the second part there, Joan, if you'll um, type that out separately, it's, it's cut off on my feed as well. Um, but I'll answer the first question about Judas. Uh, yes. So uh, actually, um, so it's, it's very much not Catholic teaching that, that Judas did not have an option. Um, it is a fundamentalist Protestant uh, theological opinion that Judas essentially had to do that. He didn't have a choice. But for us as Catholics, no, we, we don't believe that. Judas was completely free, and he chose to um, betray Jesus. He did not have to. Now, it was, in a certain sense, part of God's plan in the way that God writes straight with broken lines, right? To use that, that turn of phrase, uh, God, because he can foresee the future, he knew that Judas would do that, but he did not force Judas to. Judas was still free in that moment to choose to betray or not to betray. Um, and so uh, absolutely that was it, was, it was a sin of betrayal on behalf of Judas who did that. In a, you know, it was a completely free choice. Um, and the, the, the repentance, it's, it's interesting that you pointed out that, yeah, he did go back to Caiaphas and he threw, you know, gave the silver back the repentance that it, that saves is the repentance that leads us back to Christ. It causes us to go running back to him. So Judas is. Um, remorse that he had, it, it caused him to say, oh, no, I've done something bad. I don't want this anymore. But even our recognizing that we've done something wrong and we don't want it anymore actually isn't Christian repentance. It has to include also the running back to God. You can think of the, uh, you know, the prodigal son who, who went away and, you know, there was a time when he decided, oh, wow, I've done something wrong. This is not good. But really, that redemption moment isn't until he decides to go back to his father. Back to the tomb. Um, looks like the internet cut out there, so I'm not sure how much you guys caught. But with Peter as well, uh, Peter ran back to the tomb um, with John whenever he heard that Christ had risen. And so there wasn't this complete, um, you know, kind of running to men for repentance, but rather a running to God. And that's that distinction there, that Judas's repentance or remorse was not a remorse that, that directed him back to God. He didn't choose to run to God. He chose to run to men for, for consolation there. Great. All right. Rita is connected in. It's good to have you. And, Julie Hoy from Wills Point, welcome. Excellent. Feast. Okay, yeah, Ray is clarifying there. The Feast of Passover. That's good. Um, all right. So I think it's Bongi is how you pronounce your name. If I've got that wrong, let me know. Um, she says, "Hello, Father. I started giving away a miraculous medal with the uh, Memorare. I was wondering if there's." something I can say to people when I give them. So far, non-Catholics have been very receptive. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think explaining a little bit uh, the the story of the miraculous medal um, is is really good, how the Blessed Mother, you know, appeared and kind of showed that image. Um, and then obviously talking about uh, the love of the Blessed Mother as both the mother of Christ, but then also the, the, the mother of every disciple of Christ, how Mary or how Jesus gave to Mary all of his disciples when he looked at John and he said to the beloved disciple, as it says in, in the gospel, behold your mother. And so we should run to her uh, as we would run to any loving mother and ask for her intercession. Obviously, you want to clarify asking for Mary's intercession that she prays for us uh, and that she asks her son, who is God, 
uh, to, to pour those graces upon us. Um, and so just a little bit of, of Marian catechesis, I think would be really helpful. And also a little bit of the history. This, the story is really beautiful as well. Great question. All right. Joy says, with the Vatican uh, just beatified uh, 10 new saints today, what are the steps for anyone to become a saint in the Catholic Church? And how long does it usually take? I know they fast-tracked John Paul II, and I think the same thing happened uh, to Mother Teresa. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about the, the fast tracking there. However, the the steps are that essentially you um, do an initial research and you send that research to the Vatican and you make the request that they be uh, considered for canonization. And at that step, uh, I believe they're called, they're referred to as, um, well, once that's been accepted, then they are uh, servants of God. Then after essentially there has been an, an evaluation, a, an investigation on behalf of the Holy See into the person's life, uh, and they can prove either that they lived heroic virtue or that they were martyred. Um, and so martyrdom is always in, 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 in the hatred of the faith. So it has to be for the sake of the faith. So if they were killed for political reasons or they were killed simply because they got caught in a bad robbery or something of that sort, that doesn't count. Um, it has to be actually out of hatred for the faith uh, that they were killed. That's what qualifies as a martyrdom. Um, so first, the request, once the request is accepted, they're servants of God. Once the investigation happens and it's proven that they were either martyred or that they lived heroic virtue, in imitation of Christ, then they're made uh, venerable. And then once you're venerable, then it's a process of um, trying to prove miracles happen on behalf of their intercession. And it's actually, it's fairly strict how that has to happen. Uh, essentially, you have to have scientific proof that the, that the problem was there beforehand you have to have almost exclusive intercession, asking for their intercession, for the sake of a miracle, for their process of canonization. Um, and it has to be, a, you know, like a community of people doing this. Um, and then you have to have scientific proof afterwards that things changed and that there is no natural explanation for why that change happened in that way. And then it cannot be reversible. So... You know, it, it can't be that the tumor went away and it was gone for a while and then it came back. That doesn't count. It has to be a non-reversible miracle uh, or a non-reversed miracle. It can't just disappear for a while. Uh, and so once one of those happens, then the person can be beatified. And then once a second miracle with all of the same requirements happens, then they can be canonized. So that's that's the process. Essentially, there's a kind of historical analysis. That's what that investigation is up to venerable. And then the church says, all right, now we need a little bit more proof. God, if you would like this person to be canonized, we need two miracles that are pretty clearly through their intercession. Um, and that's beatified and canonized. Good question, Joy. All right. Good. And so Joan asked the question, did the apostles after Jesus uh, rose up vote for someone to take Judas's place? Yes, that is St. Matthias, who we actually just celebrated. I want to say Saturday? No, not Saturday. Maybe on Saturday. Maybe Friday. It was just a couple days ago. Uh, it was his feast day. Um, and you can check out the whole story in the Acts of the Apostles in the first couple of chapters. All right. Jonas, uh, she read that donating sperm or eggs or being a surrogate mother is a mortal sin. If it's a sin, why? Yeah, so... Um, we're going to deal with those separately. So first off, um, donating sperm. Uh, the the problem is, first off, I suppose the first problem is how the sperm is collected, right? Um, essentially, how do you go about doing that? Well, uh, pretty much any way that it's done now is 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 grave matter, um, right? But like by the very means of how do you get the sperm out? Um, and so that's the problem with that one. In regard to donating eggs um, and, or being a surrogate mother, 
um, there are a couple different things. Um, and I suppose this is connected to the donating sperm as well. Uh, the first thing is that part of the nature of a human being is that we ought always to be created in an act of love. Human beings who are created by God out of love and who are created and destined for the eternal union of love with God in heaven ought to also begin their existence in an act of love between two human beings. And so when it comes to either donating sperm or donating an egg or um, you know, in vitro fertilization or uh, what's the word? Um, test tube babies, any, any of those things, um, the, yeah, the, the, the uniting of the two um, gametes, the, the sperm and the egg outside of the act of, of love is contrary to the nature of humanity. We are from love, we are for love, and we are meant to live in love. And therefore, our lives, our, our existence should begin in an act of love. And so that's really the, the core problem there. We are made in the image and likeness of the God who is love. Um, beyond that, then there are some other things. <clears throat> For example, uh, in regard to being a surrogate mother. Um, so the first off, there's the issue of, well, how do you actually impregnate the woman? Right. And whether that's in vitro fertilization or whether that's through natural kind of a, a natural way to do it, um, both of those would be mortal sins. Right. Because you're either having um, intercourse with someone who you're not married to or the in vitro fertilization, which we already talked about, was this kind of creating of the person separated from the act of love, which um, <clears throat> is, is not how human beings should be created. Um, but then also there is this intention of separating the act of carrying the child from the act of raising the child. Now, if a mother is not able to raise the child that she bore in her womb and has to put them up to a, for adoption, that is the lesser of two evils than perhaps you know, terminating the pregnancy or uh, you know, essentially not raising the child, um, just letting them kind of wander around or, or not really being um, the mother that they deserve, right? And so that, um, that is a lesser of two evils when we talk about adoption or something of that sort. Um, but when we intend to have someone other than the mother that bore the child raise the child, there is a, a separation in the natural order. And there's, there's a kind of bonding that happens uh, in the womb between the child and the mother and um yeah theology and psychology and all of these different things have not totally caught up with this but you know it, you kind of intuitively understand it that there's just something not quite right about um a mother carrying the child in the womb but then it, it, it being from the egg of another mother or from um or, or that, you know, we're doing all of this with the intention that another mother would raise the child. Um, and I, I know that's not an amazing answer. However, I think that uh, at this time, at the very least, it's, it's better for us to tread very lightly, right? So first off, how these things start, we've already declared, where we've already talked about that, how that's, that's sinful, that, that's problematic. But then the very you know, nature of the surrogate motherhood in itself. Like, well, what if we could find some sort of science that did it differently? Um, when it comes to creating human beings, this is perhaps the, the highest risk, highest reward thing that we do as human beings on a natural level. And so it's, it's just important to tread lightly, right? This is a very safe, this is sacred ground. We're creating human beings in the image and likeness of God. Uh, and so we just have to tread carefully around those things. And that's why um, really at this point, the church hasn't declared 
um, infallibly or anything of the sort that surrogate motherhood in all of its situations is absolutely grave matter, moral sin, terrible. But it has said, no, don't do that because this is, this is something that's complex and the means by which that happens right now uh, are all problematic um, because of either how the sperm is collected or um, how the child is, or the, the egg is fertilized. Great question, Joan. Man, you always have good challenging questions for me. <laughs> All right. Anyon, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, says, Hi, Father, I may only want to ask you the question. My question is, why is Seventh Days are always against Catholic Church, which is the true church of Jesus Christ? Yeah, I imagine you're probably talking about the Seventh Day Adventists. Um, why are they always against the Catholic Church, which is the true church of Jesus Christ? Um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing that Catholics uh, kind of get picked on by certain other Christian groups. And I think it's, um, it is curious. Uh, there was once, uh, <laughs> there was somebody who was in the Marines and I asked him, why'd you join the Marines? And they said, well, the Marines always think that they're the best and everybody else picks on the Marines. And so, you know, if you're that set apart from all of the other branches in the military, you must be something special. Um, and I think it, it, that applies a little bit to the Catholic Church as well. You know, uh, all, of the, all of the girls in the high school are always jealous of the prettiest girl. Um, and it's kind of like all of the other Christian denominations feel like they have to attack the Catholic Church, uh, usually because they feel threatened by that, right? And so I, I think there's something that they kind of recognize. Well, no, the Catholic Church has a lot of really good arguments. And so if we want to legitimize ourselves, we have to come up with arguments against the Catholic Church and, and really attack it. Um, and so I think that's part of it. There are other parts of it, which I think are a little bit more legitimate in the sense that there are certain very dark parts of the history of the Catholic Church. There are times when the Catholic Church uh, did not do a good job fulfilling its mission in the world of being the light of Christ and of preaching the truth. And so they really attack the Catholic Church specifically for those times in the past. However, uh, if you listen to the beginning of this, um, you know, the, the Holy Spirit leads us to repentance and to conversion. Um, and so to, to look at something that an institution or a person did in the past and therefore completely reject it simply because of what happened in the past, not what's happening uh, now or what's happening, what, you know, the, the entire thing um, is, is really not according to the Holy Spirit, who is the advocate. All right. Andrea says, my friend went to a Catholic church in Tennessee at communion. They had both the body and blood. When will our church return to having both? Yeah. Um, so, we probably won't return to having separate, basically the, the host and then completely separate the chalice. And that's for two reasons. Uh, first off, um, in, the, in the rubrics, it talks about how uh, you should only use what are called extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. So essentially those are the, the non-ordained uh, Eucharistic ministers when needed. Um, and then it goes on to say that the chalice is not needed. Um, so receiving from the chalice is, is not needed. And so if you kind of logically put the two of those together, this is only when needed. This is not needed. Therefore, the, the chalices are not a reason to use more extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Um, and so we're probably not going to have that uh, here in, in Nacogdoches. They're, they're just not going to come back. Um, there is a possibility, one thing that we're kind of um, tossing around right now between among the priests and also talking to uh, some other people is the idea of uh, intinction. So what intinction is, is actually that the, the priest or the deacon dips the host into the precious blood and then distributes um, to the person. Uh, and you, you always receive on the tongue with that. So um, the person is able to receive both the precious blood uh, and the host. And really, it's just one minister distributing both of those. So it, it kind of works around both, right? So you still are able to receive the precious blood, um, but you don't needlessly have extra Eucharistic ministers. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the second reason why we don't have, we, don't, we aren't going to return to the, the precious blood is that really it's super easy to 
spill or drip or any of those things with the precious blood. Uh, I've, I've seen too many times people coming up and down stairs, uh, you know, they, they kind of trip or stumble and then the precious blood just goes pouring everywhere. And in particular, um, in our in our churches, at least in Immaculate Conception and Sacred Heart and at St. Mary's here in Nacogdoches, there's carpet right there and you don't get precious blood out of the carpet. And so then, you know, first off, that's it's desecration, whether it's willful or not, it's desecration of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and then you're kind of stuck with this question of like, well, what do we do with this carpet? Um, and yeah, it's just better to uh, avoid that. That seems like it's it's not worth the risk, um, in, in my opinion. And so <clears throat> we're, we're, we're treading very lightly in that regard, but we are kind of looking for a solution for those people who do want to receive under both kinds. All right. So I think that is the end of the, the questions that I can see. I will stay here just for a couple of seconds if you guys want to type in any other questions that you may have. Um, and if not, we will just wrap up. I'm sorry, I'm getting all sorts of notifications that my internet connection is not very good. So if you're seeing very blocky or you're not getting great audio, that's um, that's that's our fault. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'll, I'll check that out and try and get it improved by next week. All right, I don't see any other uh, any other questions coming in. So let's just finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless. Happy Sunday.